Hello, welcome to lecture 9 of game theory class. Okay, so this is the last class of week 3. Uh, we are in the process of finishing up the dominant equilibrium. And then uh, the uh, kind of prism dilemma kind of sense uh, the in this class it's game theory and its application so I want to mention the application of the game theory as much as possible because you know learning theory is interesting but then you know this is economics making predictions and things like that I emphasized so it would be fun to know where these game theories can be applied. Okay? And one thing I personally uh, enjoy, kind of I might made it by myself kind of game is nice person finishes less kind of game. Or there is a big controversy in Chinese philosophers old age whether human beings are born nice or born bad. So it's the nature of human being, is it good or is it bad? Of course, it's a question of what is good and what is bad. Uh, it's very subjective, so I would say the good is unselfish and bad is selfish. Okay? And this assumption, uh, by using dominant equilibrium, I'm going to prove that human beings are bad. They have a nasty nature. They are not nice. They are nasty. Okay, let's please hear out uh, what my uh, why I am thinking that way. Uh, the assumption is mother and son game, mother and their kids game. We have ancestors. They have played the game repeatedly. So. Uh, let's assume that there is a village, and in that village, there is ancestor one, ancestor two live together. Ancestor one can behave nicely or behave nasty. Ancestor, ancestor two also can be a good person or a bad person. So this is strategy, good and bad, good and bad, or nice, nasty, nice, nasty, same thing. Okay. If everybody is nice, the society is helping others, it's 10 and 10. If everybody is nasty, which means they only take care of themselves. So the thing is, ancestor number one, ancestor number two, I would assume their mother, has a 10 foot. Probably food is the most important thing. So they have food amount of 10 and 10. If they are good person, they will divide it half and give it father. So ancestor one, give five to ancestor two, ancestor two, give five to ancestor one. So in the end, they go back to 10 and 10. So it's kind of helping each other, but kind of nice society. What if they are bad? Ancestor ten, two, will have the 10 to himself, give nothing to ancestor 1. Ancestor 1 has nothing to give ancestor 2. That's it. But then, what if ancestor 1 all of a sudden become nice, while ancestor 2 is bad? Ancestor 2 will keep every 10 of her food to herself. On the other hand, as ancestor one, the mom is nice. So out of 10 food she has, she will give five to ancestor two. As a result, ancestor two has 15 food and ancestor one has five food. It has consequences. Ancestor one, not only she is hungry, her kids, her babies would be hungry. The hungry babies cannot grow up. They are sick, they die and things like that. Same thing here, if ancestor 1 is selfish, ancestor 2 is unselfish, ancestor 2 will give food to ancestor 1, so ancestor 2 will get 5, ancestor 1 will 
have 15, which means 10 of her own, 5 received through ancestor 2. So, once you understand this game, the players, the strategies, and the payoffs, can you find out the dominant equilibrium? Yes. 10, 15, bad is better. 5, 10, 10 is better. So, the ancestor 1, ancestor 2 would have chose the nasty uh, characteristics. If it's their choice, that's one thing. But if this game is like inside our DNA, think about, let's say like DNA game. The ancestor 1 has good, nice DNA. Ancestor 2 has nasty DNA. The nasty DNA has a better chance of having uh, next generation kids, maybe three times more, but then more and more people would have nasty characteristics as generation goes. So in this biological game, if we believe in this kind of game is being, has been played for the last 100,000 years, our ancestors who has good nature, nice nature, would disappear and what we have a selfish nasty bad uh, people right now so the fact that we are here living 21st century means our ancestors has been nasty because they suck up every food from the nice ancestors and nice ancestors disappear and our ancestors survived because they are not so nice. Anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say is, whether you believed in this game or not, the dominant equilibrium, dominant strategy can be applied to many things and it can even explain the characteristics, our nature of human beings. Okay, next. If you remember in the previous class, I said Dominant equilibrium is wonderful, fantastic in making predictions. It's just unique. They make only one prediction and it's always correct. So it is great under one condition if it exists. And I'm, I told you that in more often than not, the dominant equilibrium does not exist. Let's, I will give you that example. Driving left to a right game. Okay, in Korea, everybody drive on the right. When you drive a car, the hand is on the left side and your car goes on the right hand side. If you go to Japan or England, the car goes the other way. The hand is on the right hand side of the car and the car goes of the left lane, okay? It doesn't actually matter because if every car goes right, they are not going to bump each other. If every car goes on the left, they are not going to bump each other. But if, think about some something like this. Some cars go on the left lane, some cars go on the right lane. We have a word for that. I don't know in America what they call it. In Korea, 역주행. So, like uh, every car goes from Seoul to Busan, but one strange car using the same lane coming from Busan to Seoul. What is the chance of the traffic accident? Very high. I mean, uh, you would be really shocked that a car is approaching you from the, the say, opposite side. If I give you my personal experience, I lived in Japan for several years and I traveled a lot and sometimes I rented a car in Japan and drive. Wow, I escaped a, a traffic accident a couple of times because you know, in my whole life I drove in on the right hand side because I drove mostly in Korea and USA. In those countries, cars go on the right hand side. So, if I just uh, like uh, relax a little bit, I found that myself, my car is driving on the right hand side in Japan. 
So I was so shocked when some car is coming just towards me and then I barely escaped it. I almost got killed. So uh, every car driving on the same side, every left, every car drive on the right, that is very important. If some driver one drive left and driver two drive right, the accident would probably kill both drivers, like here and here. On the other hand, if everybody drives the same side, it's okay. Okay? So, this is kind of game. There are two drivers, they are players. They can drive left and right, left and right. There are two strategies, and these are payoffs. Does this game has a dominant equilibrium? Let's check. Driver 2 drive left. What is better for driver 1? If he drive left, same as driver 1, driver 2, he will get 10. No accident, that means. If driver 1 drive right, while driver 2 drive left, accident negative 10. So when driver 2 choose left, driver 1 is better to choose left 2. If driver 2 choose right, driver 1 choose left, it's negative 10, right, it's 10. So when driver 2 choose right, driver 1 better choose right. If you remember the dominant equilibrium, dominant strategy, whatever driver 2 does, something should be better than the other. But it is not the case here. If driver 2 left, driver 2 drives left, left is better, right, right is better. So there is no dominant strategy. Same as driver 2. So this game very simple game. Do not have a dominant strategy. Proof that, proof of that, what I said, the most of games do not have dominant strategy equilibrium. Okay. Another game, odd even game. I mean, when I was a kid, I played this game a lot. Holding, uh, Tom and Bill are playing. Tom has coins inside his hand. It can be odd number of coins, two coins or one coin. Bill can call, oh, the number of coins are odd and even. One or two, okay? If Bill is correct, so Tom is hiding how many, whether he has odd number of coins in his hand or even number of, if Bill gets correct, so when Tom hold odd number of coins in his hand, and Bill correctly called it odd, Bill wins and get 10, and Tom loses 10, so it's negative 10. Usually Tom gives $10 to, 10 cents to Bill. Same here, if Tom choose even, and Bill correctly called it, minus 10, 10. On the other hand, if Tom gets odd number of coins in his hand, and Bill says even, Bill is wrong, then Bill has to pay Tom. So 10 for Tom, negative 10 for Bill. So this kind of game. This is also a very simple game. Does this game have a dominant equilibrium? From Tom's point of view, from Bill's point of view, if Tom has odd number, calling odd is better. Because even means negative 10, odd 10, the second number. If Tom holds even, even is better because when it's even, Bill will get 10, odd, Bill will get negative 10. So from Bill's point of view, when Tom choose odd, odd is better than even. When Tom choose even, even is better than odd. So obviously, Bill does not have the dominant strategy. If you check, Tom doesn't have the dominant strategy either. Good. So once another proof that dominant strategy usually do not exist. Well, uh, I hope you uh, watch the movie Beautiful Mind. Mm, it's not very interesting, but anyway, uh, there is a professor, genius, very smart person named John Nash. And then this John Nash uh, has this wonderful research, and then when in his young age, he got kind of bizarre. He, he goes bizarre. The thing is, 
uh, John Nash uh, invented this Nash equilibrium concept, which I'm going to teach and which actually became the cornerstone of game theory. So as a game theorist who's making money <laughs> uh, by teaching game theory and re doing research on game theory, I owe enormously a lot to Nash, John Nash. And that this John Nash became, you know, lose his mind. Like psychologically he became crazy. What can I say? So uh, after several years in his young age, he accumulated great achievement, academic achievement. Actually, he wrote three important papers. Then he cannot do any research anymore. He cannot make a living. But then, because his three papers were so important, ultimately he got Nobel Prize. Congratulations. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, uh, this John, Professor John Nash, after he got Nobel Prize, he was invited to many places. Okay, so he lost his mind, but he can still talk a little bit. People understand that. But then there was car accident and he died. Uh, so even though he got Nobel Prize, his, his life was kind of tragic. But anyway, what Nash says, you know, I look at dominant equilibrium and it's so fatal that most of the game dominant equilibrium we cannot find. So without equilibrium, we cannot make predictions. So it's, we cannot have game theory field when someone asks you what would be the result, you say, I cannot make a prediction. So Nash's uh, contribution to the game theory is he found out an equilibrium, which later turned out to be Nash equilibrium, which exists 99% of the game. What did I say? The dominant equilibrium does not exist in 99% of the game. On the other hand, Nash equilibrium exists 99.999% of the game, almost every game. So when the column John, John Nash invented Nash equilibrium, the game theory begins are in business. You know, whether the equilibrium, the prediction, fortune telling is correct or not, we can say something. Okay, so what is Nash equilibrium? Normally, once the players choose a Nash equilibrium strategy, they have no reason to change to other strategies. Okay, so it's important. They, for some reason, they begin to play this. Go back. You go to, you come to Korea and you drive. And somehow you found out everybody is driving on the right hand side. Are you going to drive on the right hand side or left hand side? Because it's already kind of promised that everybody on the right in Korea and everybody getting, the drivers getting 10 and 10. You said, oh, what the heck? I'll drive on the left then you will get negative 10 instead of 10. Are you going to change from 10 to negative 10? No. Not for driver 1. What about driver 2? If driver 2 choose left hand, the current 10 would become negative 10. Would you do that? No. So once right, right is being chosen and 10, 10 is the uh, uh, payoff for each People, if they change, they got negative 10, negative 10 compared to current 10. So they will not change. What if in Japan? In Japan, everybody already drive on the left hand side. If you change, you got negative 10 and negative 10. So that's what I mean. The players have no reason to change. No reason to change means their payoff does not go up, it's going down, okay? So once, like in Japan, everybody drive on the left, left to left is the equilibrium concept, Nash equilibrium, once they play, pl drive left left, 
No one has incentive to drive on the right hand side because he would be killed by a car accident. That is the idea of Nash equilibrium. No reason to change. Cannot get a strict higher payoff by change. Uh, okay, I'm gonna talk about this again, but strictly higher. That's important. So by changing from Nash equilibrium strategy, your payoff does not go up. It may stay same, but not going up. That's what this means. Okay. Mathematically, this mu one is once again the payoff of the first player. Of course, it would be decided by strategy of first player and second player. Let's assume that Nash equilibrium switch S1 star S2 star. So new one S1 star S2 star is the payoff of first player when the Nash equilibrium are chosen by player one and two. Compared to the payoff of the first player when the second player choose the Nash equilibrium S2 star, but first player does not. S10 is not same as S1 star. So this is important. The second player, the opponent, is keep playing the Nash equilibrium. It's not changing. And you are thinking about I'm playing S1 star the Nash equilibrium to something else, S10. But then your payoff would decrease or same, which means it is not going to get higher than the Nash equilibrium payoff. We call Nash equilibrium payoff. When players play Nash equilibrium strategy, the payoff is Nash equilibrium. Same here. So basically, the players get what the payoff the players get by playing Nash equilibrium should be always bigger than or equal to the opponent here, the because payoff of the second player, the opponent is first player, the opponent's strategy is fixed at Nash equilibrium, just you change, the payoff would decrease while remaining same. So once again, the idea is the other players keep choosing, keep playing, keep selecting the Nash equilibrium strategy, and only you change from S1 star S1 zero. Then the payoff does not increase. It's decrease or same. Then we call S1 star S2 star the Nash equilibrium strategy. Once again, this inequality is not strictly bigger, but bigger than or equal to that is the key point here. So this is the formal definition of Nash equilibrium. Once you begin to play S1 star, S2 star, and getting payoff mu1, mu2, you will not change. If in Japan you drive left, the other driver drive left, in our example, the mu1 would be 10. If you change to right while other driver drive left, mu1 uh, right left would be negative 10. So, 10 is bigger than negative 10, okay? Here, if everybody drive on the left-hand side, it's 10. The driver one still driving on the left-hand side, but driver two changed to right, then driver two's payoff would be negative 10. So 10 is bigger than negative 10. That's why left, 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 left is Nash equilibrium. Uh, Okay, uh, let's do this. Uh, find out Nash equilibrium in this game. How can we do that? One by one. Thinking about S1, T2, 1, 9. Is this Nash equilibrium? No. Immediately, if the first player changed from S1 to S2, his payoff would become 1 to 8. So by changing, the payoff can increase, which means automatically S1, S2 is not Nash equilibrium. S1, S2, 4, 5, by changing, 4 can become 5, not Nash. 6, 2, 
601. Oh, maybe Nash? No. The second player, the second player changed from T3 to T2 or T1, T2 to become 4. So, reason to change. 01, 6, 1, 7, change to 6 by changing S3 to S1. 5, 5. If you change to S1, it's 4. If you change S3, 3. So, S2 can be in S equilibrium, but let's check T2. T2, if you change 5 to 4, 5 to 1. So, S2, T2 is a in S equilibrium. S2, T2. What about S3, T2? 3 can change 5. Already not possible. S3, T1, 9, 1, 1 can change 4 or 7, so it's not an S equilibrium. 8, 4, 8 can be 9, 4 can be 5. So in this game, if you check one by one, that's the only way, you will realize the only S equilibrium is S2, T2. Okay, think it over. If you, this is very important. I really want you to do it by yourself and check all nine things and figuring out why they are Nash. Once again, checking Nash is checking whether someone has reason to change, okay? And if that's one of them, one of the players, not both, one of the players has reason to change, that's not Nash. If neither, none of the players has reason to change, meaning reason to change, meaning change the strategy and get a higher payoff, none of them has that, then that's Nash equilibrium. Okay, the end of the third week.